Open Zeppelin has a really cool contract wizard for generating the code for token contracts. It generates code based on inputs and boxes you tick. And you can then copy and paste this and deploy this token contract. I'll walk you through what every option means and how to use it so you can understand exactly what you're doing when building tokens with this tool. I'm going to talk pretty fast and there's a lot of information, so feel free to pause and rewind if you need to. Notice that as we add features, it imports from Open Zeppelin contracts. So you could obviously write this code yourself, but this is a next level tool if you're not familiar with the Open Zeppelin libraries and Solidity. And it's also a good way to become familiar with them. Let's go. Name is straightforward. It's the name of your token. I'm going to name mine Pluto token. Symbol is also straightforward. That's the symbol of a stalker token. I'm going to call mine PTK, and you can see that this updates dynamically here. Pre-mint is how many tokens you want to mint and transfer to the deployer of this contract when it's deployed. I'm going to say 10,000. This then adds a call in the constructor to this private mint function. It's in the constructor, so it only ever runs once, which is when the contract is deployed. Notice the first argument is message.sender. In this context, that's the address that deploys this contract. The minted tokens go to the deployer's wallet. The second argument here is 10,000, because that's what I've inputted, times 10 to the power of whatever this decimals function returns. Token amounts are always denominated in the smallest divisible unit of the token itself. For example, way for Ether. By default, this decimals function returns 18. So you get 18 decimal places on your token. But you can override this after you copy and paste this code. That said, using 18 keeps it simple and consistent with most other tokens. Mintable. It adds a function, mint which calls the same private mint function that we see in the constructor here from using pre-mint. In effect, this allows minting more tokens from this contract after it's been deployed. By calling this function, and this function takes two and amount, it allows minting any amount of tokens to whatever address that the caller wants. While this seems like something you would always want to add to your token contract, sometimes it's not desirable for holders of your tokens, as it increases the risk. The owner could continuously mint more tokens, which, per basic supply and demand, would devalue existing tokens. Also notice the only owner modifier here. It's imported from the ownable contract. This prevents anyone except the owner from calling this contract, and we'll revisit this shortly when we get down to discussing access controls. Burnable. This is kind of the opposite of mintable. It allows token holders to burn their tokens. While we don't see any functions added here, we get access to some new functions because our Pluto token is inheriting from this ERC-20 burnable contract. By looking into the burnable contract, we can see this burn function. This is what you get access to in your contract, and it's the public function that you can call. Pausable. In plain English, it allows preventing functions from being called on the contract via pausing and unpausing the contract. You can see that it defaults to pause equals false. And there's functions for pausing and unpausing the contract. There's also some modifiers when paused and when not paused that you can add to your functions that you want to be affected by this. Now, why would you want to pause functions in your contract? Maybe there's an emergency or a hack where you want to temporarily pause movement of your tokens. Permit allows the holder to give access to tokens in their wallet to third parties for a specific period of time.
after adding this feature can be done by calling this permit function, which takes an owner, spender, a value, and a deadline for that. And from what I know, if you specify the maximum UIN256 amount for value, it becomes an infinite permit, which doesn't decrease when the spender transfers tokens out of your wallet. Keep that in mind. Votes allows delegating voting for on-chain government. And if you skim this contract that gets imported, ERC20 votes, you'll see that most of these functions added are just getters. They just retrieve vote-related information. But importantly, there is one called delegate. And this delegates votes from the sender to the delegatee. As far as I know, this feature doesn't add voting functionality, just the ability to delegate votes and pull some related voting information. Flash minting. Flash minting allows borrowing tokens as flash loans, which don't require collateral as long as they're returned in the same transaction. Under the hood, tokens are minted, lent out, used for whatever purpose the borrower wants, returned, and burned. Pretty cool, actually. The most interesting function here is probably the flash loan function. But there's also a flash fee function, which tells you the fee for a specific amount of loan. By default, the fee is zero, but you can override this to change the fee. One interesting option is to charge fees and then use those fees to buy and burn tokens. And you now have a deflationary token, which should increase in value as it's used. Snapshots. It allows specific accounts to create snapshots, which store the total token supply at that time, as well as the balance of this token in holders addresses at that time. Why would you want to do this? If you allowed voting by the number of tokens the wallet has, someone could purchase a large number of tokens right before the vote and then sell them after the vote. And snapshots could allow you to allot votes based on a time-weighted average of tokens held rather than just the number of tokens held at the time of the vote. I'll highlight a few important functions in this contract. Balance at gets the balance of an account at the time the snapshot was created. Total supply gets the total supply of tokens, the total number of tokens that exist at the time of the snapshot. And most importantly, snapshot. This creates a snapshot. You can see that this is not a public function. So it's up to you how you want to expose this in another function. And now we get to access control. Ownable. There is an owner, which by default is the deployer of the contract. And you also have access to a modifier called only owner, which we saw when we added Mintable and it allows you to restrict access to specific functions to just the owner. Aside from functions to get and check the current owner, there's also functions to transfer ownership to another address or to even completely renounce the ownership so that there will be no owner going forward. Roles, in a nutshell, allow role-based access to functions. They allow you to add a line like this in your function to exclude unpermitted roles from calling it. There are several other important functions in here, like grant role to add a role to an address, revoke role to remove a role from an address and what we already touched on above has role 
to check if an address has a specific role. This returns true if they do. Upgradeability. While you've always been told that contracts can't be modified after being deployed, that's not 100% true. There are contract architectures that allow changing a contract's behavior after it's been deployed. For example, you have one front-facing contract with functions that can be called, but that contract doesn't define the implementation of those functions. It delegates that implementation to another contract based on an address stored in a state variable. New contracts and new implementations can be deployed, and then the front-facing contract can be pointed to them to update the implementation behind each function. That's a super fast explanation. If you didn't fully get that, that's okay. Upgradability is complex. If you're interested, I can cover it in some more videos. But super quick, there's two options here. There's transparent, which is easier to implement, but requires more gas to deploy. And if you're new to upgradable contracts, I recommend sticking with that. And then there's new UPS, which uses less gas, but is more complicated to implement. We have an input field for the security contact here. And this is the email people should contact you at if they find a security flaw in your contract. And you can see that as I type here, it just gets added to a comment in my contract. And license is the distribution license for your contract. Changing this updates the license at the top. Now all you have to do is copy and paste this into a hard hat Solidity contract and deploy it, done deal. Though some of these features uh, do require a little more manual configuration. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you next time.